Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my page 112 tag for July 2022. The page 112 tag was started on book two by Sean at Sean the Book Maniac. He based it off of a French literary prize wherein they comprised the long list of, I think, novels uh, slated for the prize uh, solely by reading page 112 of the books in contention. So that's about like a third to halfway through most novels, I think. And, you know, without any of the context of the rest of the story, you can only judge the books based on the quality of the writing on that one page. I've been using this tag since the beginning of COVID to slowly cull my physical unread shelves. Well, I say slowly cull them, but I keep on replacing them with new books as you do. But anyway, <laughs> I have this uh, handy dandy books in cats mug. These have all the titles uh, that are in contention for the game that I acquired in 2021 or before. And each month I pull out three of these titles at random and then uh, read the books here on camera and discuss, well, you know, the page 112 is on camera and discuss with you what I think of them and then choose one of the books for my month's TBR. Well, that's usually the way I play the game anyway. <laughs> Every fourth month, I play a little differently and I take the runners up uh, from each of the last three months and pit them against each other and then do the tag that way. So we're in a fourth month right now uh, because I play this game monthly and anyway, it is my birthday month. So it's a special month and one of the gifts I'm giving myself is uh, not having to do the post-production of, uh, you know, pulling out new titles and having to read them now. <laughs> But it is also a little bit of a punishment because I actually do enjoy pulling these titles out, but oh well, they'll be here for me next month. So yeah, I think that about covers it. And without further ado, let's head back into the past. Only a taste and only when Wynne isn't around. She must love that, Eleanor enjoyed trying to picture it. How's she doing anyway, with her schoolwork and all? Really well, she's a bright girl. I wouldn't be surprised if she turned out to be a writer. Are Margot, you think? I do, Eleanor said, you just wait. You sound very sure of that. Tom handed her the drink. She's already shown a lot of promise. Eleanor sipped her drink. It was so good. Or did she feel that way because Tom had made it? Some of her compositions are first rate, as good as any student I've ever taught. Better, in fact. Oh, that's right. Trish said you used to be at Brandon Wythe. Eleanor nodded, hoping to discourage further questions. An excellent school, or at least that's what I hear. Why'd you leave? Mr. Bellamy, she couldn't call him Wynne, had asked her the same question. It was time to move on. Eleanor hoped her voice remained light and did not betray her. The song ended and Nat King Cole's sentimental reasons came on next. She jumped on the distraction, swaying her head and humming along to the music. Tom took another sip of his drink, set it down, and grinned at her. Shall we dance? He said. Clearly, her ploy had worked. Pie forgotten, Eleanor set her own drink down and moved easily into his open arms. They danced without speaking for a few minutes, but the silence brimmed with sensation. Tom felt so different from Ira, tall, sinewy, with an expansive, easy way of moving. The song ended and an announcer's unctuous voice came on, extolling the many considerable virtues of the latest model Chrysler. Tom let his arms remain around Eleanor and she did not move away. So yeah, this is kind of what I was talking about from the last one in that, uh, or the opposite of the last one because there was a little bit of exposition to explain Eleanor's feelings, but there was a lot of present action going on in this, uh, this page. Uh, we had a lot of dialogue, you know, people talking in real time, and then they were dancing in real time. So uh, I feel like that's d more compelling in terms of storytelling. Uh, although I do like me some exposition. And in this case, though, I'd quibble about <laughs> it. There's not a lot of exposition, but I'd quibble about it because uh, it's, uh, I think uh, the, read the author is uh, bashing us over the head a little too much with uh, Eleanor's concern over this question about her past uh, work history. I mean, uh, I think she, the author tells us way too many times so bluntly, she doesn't want to talk about this, she doesn't want to talk about this, and I'm like, why couldn't you just go with, like, you know, Tom asks her about it, and then she immediately, you know, 
as soon as she can, um, you know, jumps onto the song to switch the topic. And if we just focused on that or how, like how quickly she jumped to the song, like instead of answering, that would tell us with her actions that, you know, she is worried about talking about this and doesn't want to talk about this without the author telling us several times in a row, oh, I'm so nervous, I don't want to talk about this. So <laughs> I'm feeling very writerly, I think, in this page 112 tag in terms of my like uh, thoughts on these pages. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, I think this is interesting. Uh, we obviously have a character with a hidden past and she has this interest, it seems, in this other character, Tom. Uh, you know, since we're in the middle of the book, there's a lot we just don't understand. We're in the middle of a conversation. Uh, we're talking about this character, Margot, and we can tell from the dialogue that she's uh, Eleanor's pupil and that we don't know how Tom, I think, fits into that equation. But um, yeah, so, you know, that part is, you know, confusing because we don't have the context, but it seems like it has promise for interesting character relationships, but uh, I do what a quibble about <laughs> I guess that one thing <laughs> kind of just uh, feels a little too uh, pedestrian she appeared at my side redolent of jasmine her scent betraying her stealth a quick sideways glance and an even briefer smile then we both resumed our inspection of the lawn and the dark woods beyond her black dress was trimmed at the collar and cuffs in white, for she followed the smart fashion twice removed from the haute couture of Mrs. Kennedy. But Tess Wodehouse managed to copy the style without looking foolish. Perhaps it was her quiet poise as we stood at the rail. Any other girl my age would have felt the necessity to speak, but she left it to me to decide the moment of conversation. It was nice of you to come. I haven't seen you since when? Grade school? I'm so sorry, Henry. I flicked my cigarette into the yard and took a sip from my drink. I heard you once at a recital downtown, she said, four or five years ago. There was a big to-do afterward with a ranting lady in a red coat. Remember how gently your father treated her? As if she weren't crazy at all, but a person whose memory had come undone. I think my daddy would have told her to buzz off, and my mother probably would have punched her on the nose. I admired your father that night. While I remembered the woman in red, I had not remembered Tess from that night, had not seen or thought of her in ages. In my mind, she was still a little tomboy. I set my glass down and invited her with a sweeping gesture to a nearby chair. With a demure and becoming grace, she took the seat next to me, our knees nearly touching, and I stared at her as if in a trance. She was the girl who had wet her pants in second grade, the girl who had beaten me at the 50-yard dash in sixth grade. When I went off to the public high school in town, she took the bus to the Catholic girls' school in the other direction, vanished. Those intervening years had shaped her into a beautiful young woman. Do you still play piano? she asked. I hear you're up in the city college. Are you studying music? This was an interesting one to me because there's a lot of backstory in it. I feel like there's very little that's happening in the present. But I think it's a clever way for Donahue to put in that backstory because it's not someone, well, not someone entirely just standing off into space saying, I remember such and such, but it's, you know, interspersing it with a conversation in the here and now with this person that apparently the protagonist hasn't seen in several years. So, uh, you know, the uh, immediate conversation gives way to, you know, remembrances of the past, at least mostly. I, I do kind of feel like he... Uh, went off on a little bit of ramble, I guess, on his own a bit uh, in new directions and barely said anything in the here and now of the scene. <laughs> uh, but maybe I'm being nitpicky and <laughs> speaking as someone who writes a lot of backstory and exposition or maybe too much herself. So, yeah, that's interesting. I, I do feel like some of it is a little, I don't know, maybe I'm just being picky, but like, you know, the language is so stereotypical, like staring at her as though you're in a trance or something. It's just uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's fine because obviously he doesn't know this person anymore. So he's kind of putting her like on a bit of a pedestal or, you know, painting her in a one dimensional sort of way, which is fine for this scene. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, I, I still found it interesting. You know, it was a, you know, a fun scene to imagine at the piano recital and uh, talking about, uh, well, I mean, his dad seems like a really nice guy. That's somebody I'd want to know who doesn't, you know, brush off somebody who's uh you know, annoying, I suppose. You know, it's easier to, you know, admire that sort of behavior from afar. Uh, I thought it 
flowed well for the most part. Uh, could definitely be interested to see where this goes. Although the, uh, I guess the present day scene is a little confusing to me. Like, you know, it seems like in the beginning he didn't know she was there, but then she was there, but then they continued inspecting something together. But again, that could just be context from before. Maybe they were inspecting something and then she left and then she, you know, came back and he only knew because of the scent or something. Uh, I'm wondering what they're inspecting. You know, this is supposed to be a little speculative, I think, so when you're looking into the deep woods, hopefully maybe that'll come back uh, later or earlier in the story. Uh, we shall see. Pino thought about the massacre in Mena when the Nazis machine-gunned the Jews in the lake. He felt sick and helpless. Your husband, he must have been a brave man. Mrs. Napolitano wept and nodded beyond brave. After she regained her composure, she dabbed a handkerchief to her eyes and in a hoarse voice said, Father Ray said you two will take me to Switzerland. Yes, but with this snow, it won't be easy. Nothing in life worth doing is easy, the violinist said. Pino looked down at her shoes, low black pumps. Did you climb up here in those? I wrapped them in pieces of a baby blanket. I still have them. They won't work, Pino said, not where we're going. It's all I have, she said. We'll find you boots among the boys. What size are you? Mrs. Napolitano told him. By afternoon, Mimo had found a pair and rubbed the leather with a mixture of pine tar and oil to make the boots waterproof. He'd also gotten her wool pants to wear beneath her dress and an overcoat and a wool hat and mittens. Here, Father Ray said, handing out white pillow sacks with holes cut out for shoulders and heads. Wear these. Why? Mrs. Napolitano asked. The way you're going is exposed in several places. Someone from far down on the valley floor might see your dark clothes, but with these you'll blend into the snow. Accompanying Mrs. Napolitano was the D'Angelo family, Peter and Liza, the parents, and seven-year-old Anthony and his nine-year-old sister Judith. From a bruise, they were physically fit from a lifetime of farming and climbing in the mountains south of Rome. Mrs. Napolitano, however, had spent much of her life indoors and sitting down playing the violin. She said she walked everywhere in Milan, rarely taking the trolley, but Pino could tell from her breathing at Casa Alpina that the climb was going to be an ordeal for her and for him. Well, that was arresting stuff. I'm remembering now that uh, I knew from what my parents said that the book took place in Rome, and I believe the main character is someone who starts working for the resistance. Surely in this scene, the main character, or this Pino character anyway, is working to smuggle people out of occupied uh, Italy uh, because it is dangerous in uh, World War II, especially uh, for Jews and other undesirables. It seems from that passage that Mrs. Napolitano's husband uh, could have been Jewish or can, at least uh, Pino was connecting him to uh, murdered Jews. This is the sort of scene I think that uh, you don't need to have a lot of work done to it really to be compelling because it's a survival story. So most people, at least, you know, on an external level would, you know, have some adrenaline invested in, oh, so are they going to survive? Are they going to make it? You know, this uh, particular page asks certain survival questions that we might have, like, you know, what do we do about uh, inclement weather and uh, the types of shoes to wear and the ways to blend in when, you know, you have to sneak out of a country and how different types of people will do on the terrain. Uh, Mrs. Napolitano seems to be an indoorsy person and they're assuming it's going to be a bit of a struggle, uh, but the other family they're with is more outdoorsy. So yeah, I mean, uh, externally speaking, you don't have to do a lot uh, to make this compelling. I do think the writing does well enough. You know, it uh, conveys the information, uh, you know, in a uh, straightforward manner. It also gives a little time for emotional beats, but obviously not too much because, you know, we're in a, you know, a hurry plot mode right here, right now. So yeah, this could be good stuff. Okay, I'm running out of ridiculous sounds I can make for my return to present, but here we go. And to recap, my April book was Not Our Kind by Kitty Zeldis. My May book was The Stolen Child by Keith Donahue. And my June book was Beneath a Scarlet Sky by Mark Sullivan. And I think, given the tenor of the conversation you just heard, we can quickly knock this one off the list now. I think it's the one I had the most problems with the writing. So anyway, uh, I'll be putting this one back on the shelf. And so it's down to these two books, 
which are actually, uh, in the spirit of my birthday month, uh, birthday gifts from years past. I believe uh, my sister got this book for me last year, and my parents got this book for me two years ago. <laughs> So with that in mind, do you think I should go ahead and read this book and finally get it off of the TBR? But <laughs> I have two things working against this, and they're not necessarily page 112 tag related, but uh, oh well. <laughs> the first one is this length. You know, it is a bit of a chunkster, and I am already reading another big chunkster book this month, so I feel more justified in scaring away from this one a little bit. <laughs> And speaking of repeats, it is a uh, historical fiction book taking place in World War II in Italy. And I just read one of those uh, for the beginning of this month as well. So I have that covered too. So yeah, I think I'll be putting this one back on the shelf as well. And that leaves A Stolen Child by Keith Donahue, which I am very excited about, even though I know in the tag I was wondering, you know, there was a lot of backstory that was interesting, but not a lot of, you know, front story going on. So we'll have to see uh, if uh, that clears up. But I also know that my sister adored this book, and that's why she got it for me at all. And in fact, uh, last night I was going ahead and texting new book ideas to my family, you know, for my birthday coming up. And she immediately came back with, well, did you read the book I got you last year? And I'm like, that was pretty exciting because I already knew I'd be picking it for this page 112 tag. So, you know, <laughs> I got to feel accomplished and justify people buying me books. So that's a good thing. Meanwhile, I'm pretty sure my parents forgot all about that other book. So <laughs> there we go. So, yes. This will be uh, joining my July TBR, and I'll be talking about it in one of my upcoming AM reading videos. So that about covers it for me now. I will leave the Goodreads links for all three of these books uh, linked down below. Um, another thing I like to do in these uh, outros is to highlight another TBR game or readathon or that sort of thing going on in the community, because I kind of feel like my page 112 tags are in that spontaneous, fun sort of nature. And plus, it's fun to highlight, you know, other members of the community and what they're doing for their reading. And uh, one person who's done a lot, not only for her reading, but for the reading of a lot of people uh, doing this challenge with her is uh, Katie from Books and Things, who for the past few years has been running Jane Austen July, which is a Jane Austen inspired readathon with various prompts about uh, reading one of her novels and one of her lesser known works and then works about her and, you know, and adaptations and that sort of thing. So I'll link to her uh, video announcement for this year down below. Anyway, I'm still uh, in the vein of TBR games myself. I play another one as well, so you should hopefully see me back on this channel in the next couple of days to do my Booktube Spin number seven, which is a TBR game I play quarterly, started by Rick McDonnell, where uh, we have a list of 20 books that we all make individually, and then he does a spinny thing, as I call it, and we read the books or book that he uh, landed on. So stay tuned for that one as well. In the meantime, I hope the rest of you are enjoying and accruing your TBRs and uh, getting to them as well. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.